Let's pray. O God of Israel, God of our fathers, our God and God and Father of our Lord, the Mashiach Yeshua, we praise you that we occupy nobody's land. We live in your land. <coughs> Open to us who are still in exile and in the diaspora, the gates of Zion, that we may come, come home. And send to us in our day soon and speedily the Messiah ben David. Take from the hearts of our people the veil of unbelief. As we look into your Torah, reveal him to us. Who died for our sins according to the Tanakh. And was raised again according to the Tanakh. Yeshua. The Son of God. And so edify us, build us up, correct us, challenge us, transform us, and encourage us this day from your word. Amen. I want to consider with you today an important subject, the subject of how to know the will of God. How to know the will of God. Western ideas of knowing the will of Hashem are usually the shallowest of all. Simply because when one has dismissed Torah from the consciousness and diminished its importance, one is left with nothing with which to know the mind of Hashem. Thus people are cast into the bewildering array of super spiritual suggestions. which abound for knowing the purpose of God for our lives. We have heard so often the explanation, I have such peace about it. Or the way just opened up miraculously. Or I feel so certain that the Lord is saying to me, or sometimes just blatantly, the Lord said to me. We waken up with words. I woke up with a word this week. On Tuesday morning as it happened, I woke up with a tune and words going through my mind. And I was certain that the words were about Zion and, and its walls. And this truth was going through my mind. I just couldn't quite locate the words which I had in my mind just as I was waking up. And about an hour later, it suddenly came to me. Leo will appreciate it wasn't Zion at all or Zion's walls. It was somewhere else. And it was a song that hadn't come from Hashem, I can assure you. I get a word. I feel the Lord is saying, I have such peace. And so on. And people launch out into the sea of life, certain that the direction they are taking is from God. Even if Oftentimes, it is directly contrary to the Torah because they feel it is right. When we diminish Torah from our consciousness and diminish its importance, we are left to judge the will of God by our feelings.
Our parasha provides us with an interesting dilemma. Belan, a pagan, a soothsayer, a false prophet heard from Hashem. And yet, when he acted upon the instructions of God, we read in the Midbar 22, verse 22, but God was incensed at his going. So the angel of Hashem placed himself in his way as an adversary. The dilemma is that it would appear that Bilam had the will of God, and yet he did not. How do I know the will of the eternal? How do I know what it is? Is the question which every serious person asks. It is imperative to our lives and despite the fact that the events recorded here seem to confuse the situation rather than help, they hold the key which we desire to possess. The sages taught that there is a link between Pharaoh and Bilam and Lavan. The link with Pharaoh is understood from the similar reaction to Israel in the Midrach 22 verse 3 and Shemot 1 verse 12. In Shemot we read, the Egyptians came to dread the people of Israel. And in our parasha, in the Midbar 22, verse 3, Moab dreaded the people of Israel. The fact that Bilam was set to curse Israel links him with the attitude of the Moabites and with Pharaoh. The link between Bilam and Lavan is due to the fact that if not descended directly from Lavan, he was from the same vicinity, the same geographical area. Petor on the Euphrates River is in central Syria. Thus the Midrash Tan Kokoma Vayetse 13 comments on Divarim 26 verse 5 and the Midrash 23 verse 7. Bilam is Lavan. As it says, and our men, uh, Aramian, tried to destroy my father. So if he's not descended from the van directly, he's from the same vicinity. Midrash Tanchuma Bayetzi says, Levan, Bilam is Levan. And Aramean tried to destroy my father. Since he wished to wipe out Beni Israel, he is referred to as Arami, as it says, go and curse Israel. Levan had desired to keep hold of the household of Yaakov. To keep us under his control and with the passage of time we would have adopted his gods and his customs and thus been cut off from Hashem. You know the story well. Seven years Yaakov served for Rachel, another seven for Rachel again. Suddenly Hashem directs him to go back to Eretz Israel and he leaves. He takes his wives, his children, his possessions and he quickly leaves and he's pursued by Levan. Why? Levan wanted to hold on to us. In the process of time we would have become just like him and his people. We would have worshipped his gods. We would have adopted his customs. And that's why it was imperative that it was time to leave. 
The sages gave us an interesting insight into that whole event when our, our mother Rachel is in the tent and Levan comes. He's looking for his household gods. And when he enters the tent, uh, Rachel excuses herself uh, for not rising because she is in Kniba in her period of ritual uncleanness. Levan didn't find his gods because they were under her. The sages say rather than believing that she was taking the gods with her as objects of worship, we should understand that in her state of ritual uncleanness, she sat on them. Whereas Pharaoh desired first physically and then spiritually to destroy Israel, so did Levan and so did Balaam. To curse Israel is a transgression of the Torah in Bereshit 12 verse 3, where God says, I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse anyone who curses you, and by you all the families of the earth will be blessed. For any who might argue that this was a, a personal promise only, we reply that Hashem makes it clear that this is for the nation that would spring from Abraham by repeating the blessing in Bereshit 22 verses 17 to 18. I will most certainly bless you and I will most certainly increase your descendants to as many as there are stars in the sky or grains of sand on the earth. Your descendants will possess the cities of their enemies and by your descendants all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you obeyed my order. This time Hashem specifies that the nations of the earth will be blessed, will bless themselves in Abraham's seed. That is the offspring through Yitzhak, since it is Yitzhak and not Yishmael that his seed is to come from. For Balaam to accept a commission to curse Israel was to act against the revealed will of God, what we term as objective truth. That is truth which cannot be disputed because it is absolute. But let me tell you something about human nature, brothers and sisters. Human nature, whenever it desires to go against truth, will dispute even objective truth in spite of itself. So they come. I have a word from the Lord. Yes, but here's what the Torah says, brother. Oh no, that's not. That's not for me. That's for the Jews. No, brother. The word says foreigners. Ah, but that's not for today. That's for that day. No, brother. It's talking about when the Messiah is here. Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, guard your hearts. Isn't that what we looked at in the Bet Midrash last time? Guard your hearts. Why? Because when you or I want to go against the will of God, we will do it in of the objective truth. Objective truth cannot be disputed because it is absolute and even when we dispute it it is still truth. Oh but I don't believe that God wants the Gentiles to be circumcised. God says it. Whether you believe it or not, it is the truth. So 
So we begin to see the severity of the dilemma which Bilam had. Because not only did it appear that Hashem directed Bilam to go with the men from Moab, but that he directed him in the full knowledge that he was going to act contrary to the Torah. Do you get the dilemma? The dilemma is this. We are saying the will of God is the Torah. And yet here we have a man who is told by Hashem to go contrary to the will of God in the Torah. So might not Bilam have had a cause to protest, as many do today, that it was the will of Hashem that he acted contrary to the Torah? Many do it today. Yes, I know. I know, said one pastor to me. I know that, that Christmas is pagan. I know. But, whenever you hear that little word, but, from the mouth of someone who's agreeing with the Torah, remember this, goats, but. But, I minister to Gentiles. What, Gentiles can't understand the truth? What are you saying, brother? Gentiles are intellectually inferior. They can't understand God's truth. Is that what you're saying? So might not Balaam have said, but, but you told me to go. Let me direct your attention to Diverim. Chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. These verses deal with the prophet whose words come to pass. You see, we have another verse, don't we? It says, if a prophet prophesies and his words don't come to pass, you know he's a false prophet. Everyone knows that. Everyone agrees with it. Even those who still follow false prophets. But here's a prophet whose words come to pass. And to them says, let us go and serve other gods. The relevance is surely clear. Divine 13 verses 1 to 3 says, if such a thing happens, Hashem our God is testing us to see if we love Hashem our God with all our heart and being. Even if someone comes and it appears that Hashem is with him, even if it seems that he has heard from God. Even if it seems that he has heard from God, if his message is contrary to what the Torah teaches, Hashem says you are not to listen to what that prophet or dreamer says. I was thinking about dreams this morning. I'm not a scientist and I'm not, a, I'm not skilled in the matter of dreams. But we're told that the dreams we remember are the dreams that come just before we wake up. So who knows what dreams we've been having during the night. But the dreams we remember are the ones that come to us. The words we get when we're waking up. I was thinking about this this week. I was reminded of the words of Yahu the prophet. Do you know what he said? He who has a dream, let him tell his dream. And he who has my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the wheat to the chaff, says the shepherd.
People in certain circles band these sort of statements about as though they're a sign of great spirituality. Oh, so and so hears from God. Like your chess player. Oh, yes, oh, yes, so and so. Very spiritual. God speaks to her. He gets words from God. Do you know what all that's about, brothers and sisters? Do you know what Jeremiah, Yirmiyah, the prophet, says it's about? He says it's about wheat and chaff. It's about spiritual immaturity. Because spiritual maturity is the word of God. That's what God says. Spiritual maturity is the word of God. Give me a man or a woman any day who knows the scriptures and that person tops the greatest dreamer of dreams. What is my word to the chaff? Hashem knows the inner person. He knows the desires which we hold within us. Many of the dreams which people have are sourced in their inner person, in the desires which they have within them. Balaam's desire was not godly. He was not a righteous man. Forget about when he says, what Hashem my God says. Even although he heard from Hashem, Hashem was testing his heart in the full knowledge that Balaam longed, he longed to go with these men. Because in Bimidvar 22 verse 12, Hashem had specifically forbidden him to go or to curse Israel. But he longed to curse Israel. We know from Bimidvar 31 verse 16 that although he was unable to curse us, he gave advice to the king of Moab as to how he might still achieve our destruction. And that advice was that the king of Moab should allow the women of Moab to entice the men of Israel into sexual sin and into idolatry and we would be destroyed. Make no mistake about it. The Lamb wanted to curse Israel. Hashem allowed him to have his heart's desire go with them. On you go. On you go. I've told you before, I've forbidden you to go. I've forbidden you to curse Israel. You're going to act against my Torah. That's what you want. On you go. He could have refused. Balaam could have said that this is against what Hashem had said previously. He did not. He took the opportunity to go. The Midrash Lachach Tov says that God was incensed by his eagerness to go. But Am is not alone in this. We read of the prophet Yonah that he rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of Hashem. Undoubtedly, he was at his morning prayers since he had yet to reach Yafo and Seil, something which would have been unusual to have happened after nightfall. So we know he got to Yafo during the daytime, possibly just in the evening, just when the last ship was about to sail. But when he started, he was undoubtedly in his morning prayers. That was a prayer is evident in the language of the passage. That is why he rose up. 
he had evidently been before Hashem when he decided to flee from him. Thus he had been engaged in prayer, part of which involved him praying that all abominations would cease and the whole world would acknowledge Hashem as God, just as we did today. Never ceases to amaze me how often men and women sit in synagogue and they pray that prayer that the whole world will know and acknowledge that Hashem is the only God and then go off and do whatever they want. Evidently he's not their God. When Hashem commissioned him to go to Nineveh and deliver his message, Jonah was not keen to do so. He tells us later that this was because he knew that when Nineveh repented, Hashem would have mercy on the city. He made his way to Yafo. And it seems that he did so just in time because there was a ship casting off, ready to sail to Tarshish when he arrived. And what is more, the Hebrew of the prophecy simply says that he, he paid her price. So everything just worked out as it should have for him. It was miraculous. The way the way opened up. He suddenly felt he had to go to Tarshish. In spite of the word of God, he felt in his heart he had to go to Tarshish. And when he got there, lo and behold, there's a ship in the process of leaving just exactly to the place he wants to go. How often have we heard, heard people talk like that? It was just amazing how it, the way just opened up before me. It opened before Jonah and he ended up in a fish. There were no obstacles, no delays. Everything just opened up for him. And he went to the very place that he, he intended to go in the first instance. Yet he was running from God. Hashem sometimes lets us go. He gives us the opportunity to choose between his will and our desires. And at times when we are determined, he allows us to choose unwisely. He intervened with Bilam. That is what we should take note of. When the prophet chose his heart's desire to curse Israel, Hashem opposed him. Despite the apparent endorsement at the beginning, Hashem set himself against the erroneous route that this false prophet had started upon, and he did so vigorously, until at last Balaam had to acknowledge that he was at odds with God. Still, even when confronted with the truth in a most amazing way, through a talking donkey, Bilam had his heart set on opposing Israel. Don't be misled by the words recorded in chapter 22, verse 34. If you still disapprove, I will turn back. Bilam had no, no desire to turn back. He desired to, to save his own life. But to comply with the will of God? No. That was not his concern. Thus the angel of Hashem once more gave him his heart's desire. Go with the men, but you must say nothing except what I tell you. We have an interesting detail here in verse 38. Bilam, having met Balak, says that he will only be able to speak the words which God puts into his mouth. In this way he identified the angel of Hashem as a manifestation of God. He acknowledged the absolute failure of his mission, yet he continued with it. And this exposes the true nature of his character 
and attitude towards Hashem. Brothers and sisters, let's just, just cut to the chase. When people act against Torah, that is their true attitude towards Hashem. We can say all sorts of things. They were lovely people. We can say all the platitudes we like. At the end of the day, when we act, you and I, when we act against the Torah, that's what's inside. That's what really is going on. That's what our real attitude against it towards Hashem is. In chapter 22, verse 6, Balak specifically calls upon him to come and curse Israel. That is the purpose for his going. Nothing else. Balak had no other use for him. He did not want him to divine the future or to foretell what Israel might or might not do to, the, to his nation. He wanted Israel cursed. That is all. And that is the reason the Lamb went. That also is all. Nevertheless, the encounters with Hashem demonstrate that he would not succeed in his mission. Instead, Hashem will cause him to foretell Israel's prosperity. And in chapter 24, verse 14, he foretells what Israel will do to the Moabites and Edom and Amalek and the Canaanites. And all of this, all of this must have been terrifying to Balak. Yet despite the failure of his mission, Balaam carried on against God. Hashem allows men to work against him. And he uses their work against him to achieve his purposes for this world. That's why we can smile. We can smile when Mr. I am a dinner jacket ranks against Israel. We can smile when David Cameron is against Israel. We can smile when Barack Hussein Obama ranks against Israel. We can smile because they're just doing the work of God. Or they don't think so. But they are. There is only one guide as to the will of God in our lives and that is the Torah. The spirit which motivates us to carry on regardless in our own path and with our own agenda is the spirit of Torahlessness. Let me explain how serious this is in closing. Revelation 12 verses 10 to 13 has an astounding statement about the ancient serpent, the adversary. We read there now, Now hath come God's victory and power and kingship and the authority of his Mashiach, because the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them day and night before God, has been thrown out. They defeated him because of the Lamb's blood and because of the message of their witness. I want you to take notice of that little phrase for a moment, the message of their witness. It's not the message of their witness. It's the message of the testimony which is theirs. What is that testimony? The prophet Isaiah tells us, Yeshayahu chapter 8. He says that they speak not according to the Torah and the testimony. Do you know what the testimony is? It's the ten words. The testimony was written on those two tablets of stone and placed in the ark of the testimony. They overcame him. They defeated him because of the Lamb's blood and because of the message of their testimony. Even when facing death, they did not cl cling to life. Therefore, rejoice, heaven, and you who live there. But woe to you, 
land and sea, for the adversary has come down to you, and he is very angry. Why? Why is Satan so very angry in this world today? Because, the scripture says, because he knows that his time is short. When the dragon saw that he had been hurled down to the earth, we read, he went in pursuit of the woman who had given birth to the male child. We don't have time to expand that passage in Revelation 12 today. So look at it for yourself. But for the moment, accept what I'm going to tell you. Then check it out for yourself. As with everything I ever tell you. Check it out for yourself with the Bible. The Word of God. The woman is Israel. And the child's the Mashiach. And the dragon saw that he had been hurled down to the earth. He went in pursuit of the woman who had given birth to the male child. Where are Israel's friends today? Few. Few. The whole world's against the woman. Why? What have we done? <laughs> While our cousins have been making bombs, we've been finding cures for cancer. While our cousins have been destroying even the industries they have, we've been finding ways to irrigate the land. Why does the world hate Israel? The dragon is in the world. This is an astonishing passage. It records the defeat of the enemy through the blood of the Lamb, the Messiah. And through the power of the Torah. But his defeat is brought about by the faithfulness of those who will not yield to him. So he is cast out from the heavens to work havoc on the earth. And immediately he goes after the woman Israel who gave birth to the Mashiach. But Hashem delivers her. Note the, state, the statement. He is very angry because his time he knows that his time is short. Baruch Hashem. Let me give you counsel, every one of you. Never take it upon yourself to speak ill of Hasatan. Don't ever be tempted to take him on or to disrespect him. Even the archangel disputing with him over the body of Moshe, said, Hashem rebuke you. Let Hashem rebuke him. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, let our hearts dance within us that he is defeated, his time is short. He is a defeated enemy, but he is defeated through the power of Mashiach's blood. And yet, he will continue with his mission to destroy Israel even though, he, even though he knows that his time is short. Even though he knows that he won't succeed. This is a spirit which refuses the will of God in favor of our own agenda. Get a hold of that, brothers and sisters. Because each one of us at times in our lives has thoughts and emotions which are against the Torah. And sometimes we are, at, we are tempted to act upon them against the Torah. So get a hold of this truth. Get it in your heart today. Whenever your heart tells you to do something which is against the Torah, understand this, the spirit that is motivating you, the spirit that is speaking to you, the spirit that is giving you imaginary words, is the spirit of the dragon. 
Torahlessness. It's a spirit which refuses the will of God in favour of our own agenda and desires and Hashem allows men to have it to their own destruction. So let us examine our lives. Let us refuse our own desires no matter how much we might be tempted to excuse them. Let us be like those who cling to God and not to the lie. Then we shall know the will of God and we also shall see the defeat of the serpent. Hashem Yeshua. Amen.